Security, yes, vulnerabilities, we keep seeing that, especially at layers where, you know, you have a, a, a bridging layer or an abstraction or smart contract vulnerabilities, and trust is paramount when it comes to any ruling of financial services. Uh, so I think a lot needs to be done, um, especially addressing that, uh, and, and it's how do you uh, make it secure but at the same time intuitive, right? And that's something we uh, try to uh, keep it in our heart when we build our systems. So a centralized uh, wallet structure and, you know, a centralized custodian model where you give uh, the control of your keys and where they can unilaterally move funds to a centralized organization may bring you that Amazon kind of interface and make it very easy, seamless to move and transact, but there is huge counterparty risk. So that's the first thing, whether you're a stablecoin issuer, a custodian, is how do you eliminate that? It's through regulation, some of them are trying to bring it. You need to go to an audit process, whether it's a smart contract or proof of reserves, or make sure on-chain as well, what you say is on the reserve is what exists, right? So that is one, how do you safeguard customer funds? And the other is the cybersecurity aspect where we see increasingly in the abstraction, the proxy layer, where, they, uh, uh, where you see that these uh, 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 people uh, looking for vulnerabilities are constantly evolving as well. So I think a lot of work needs to be done. Privacy is again another aspect that you brought in. So especially when we talk about decentralized identity, it's a great uh, utopian view where it's all your data and stuff is user-owned, self-control, it's not maintained by a central authority or including a government agency, and it's in your user control and stuff. But people don't want everything to be visible on blockchain, including seeing your transactions. So again, you need to take a balanced view. Yes, you need that immutable set of records on blockchain, provide full transparency. For instance, we are working not just in the P2P remittance, but also B2B, like between telcos, on a monthly basis, since we are in this uh, forum where it's predominantly a huge portion of telcos coming, uh, they do transact on a monthly basis for settling the roaming, interconnect, and the wholesale costs. That's billions of dollars through the antiquated plumbing and the traditional financial institutions. Right now, you want to bring them on chain and have these stable coins to, instant set, uh, to settle instantly with subsequent finality and a fraction of fees. But you want to maintain that privacy as well. Again, technology has been addressing that. Zero knowledge uh, uh, technology, especially with proof and verifiers where you do uh, uh, exhibit only the data that's needed to prove that you are the owner of that transaction. I think that's, again, significantly been addressed. So it's a great point that you bring. The challenge has always been this blockchain trilemma of having a very highly secured system, but scalable enough and sufficiently decentralized. It's very hard to get that balance. And I think you will have to a little bit compromise in one of these dimensions based on that specific use case. If security and privacy are paramount, maybe it can't be an open blockchain, a public blockchain. It needs to be a semi-permission uh, to manage that. That's, that's my perspective. Even if it is not in a truly decentralized world, so that's where I differ because initially it was about ubiquitous access to anybody and with full privacy proof. I think still the KYC anti-money laundering and that's why it is very important to borrow the principles from and we, we look at ourselves as the bridge between the traditional financial and the crypto world. So that's why we want to be the bank and issue stablecoin bank accounts directly out of your stablecoin. So it's a, it's a different paradigm from the fractional reserve lending model and you start owning your bank accounts and whatever the reverse repo rate and the central bank rate at that time is, you're able to enjoy that. So if you're a successful KYC holder with min, no minimum deposit, you get to that minimum bank account access. And now with this license and with the already compliance and, and real time, with, with what we just mentioned, like you have that transparency so you're able to see on blockchain end to end. Not if you're a bank and you see all the transactions happen within your platform, you move into Swift, you lose control as soon as it hits the next wall garden. So the money laundering tools, the regulatory platform, the KYC is all already there. So I think with that, the access should definitely improve. I think the bigger challenge now is going to be user adoption. So why haven't we reached that scale, right? So it is a, it's, it's a burning question. It's not an easy one to solve. Let's look at peer-to-peer -peer remittances. What do people look for? It's about trust. You got to build that education and awareness, make it very intuitive. You have on one side, which is the MetaMask of the world. You can't ask a common person in Africa to do that. So you got to be creative and look at these embedded payments and financial services into existing mobile wallets. Maybe you don't need another self 
of custodial wallet if you're thinking about Twilio adoption. Or you may want a semi-control like what we have done. It's a multi-signature wallet where we provide the flexibility of a centralized authority, but also give full control and user access. I think so that's one about the user adoption. There are other things, interoperability between different blockchain layers. There are plenty of, I think David mentioned, layer ones, layer two is happening. And if you're asking customers to do the bridging between different ecosystems, it just doesn't work. And the last but not least, the biggest networks in the world, Visa and MasterCard and stuff, they built this network effect. They built the incentive structure for the merchants and they have this uh, vast point of sale, one card network. They have the loyalty scheme on the other. So they need to be on both sides driving the supply demand and addressing the liquidity issues. And then you get past the inflection point to drive truly access. Oh, thank you. that's a great question. If, if FinTech market isn't ready, I would struggle to uh, think which other, because by de definition, they've tried to disrupt the incumbents. If you think about uh, the Digibanks, the Wise, and those of the world, they try to address the same issues we talk about, which is fees, settlement time, access, transparency, and user friendliness, right? And provide all that. Uh, I think uh, it's ripe for disruption. The regulatory was a big hurdle with that uh, getting slowly resolved. A lot of them, uh, I see that they would uh, embed uh, direct merchant settlement. We, I think uh, Stripe was a great example. We see that with all the players we work with, Checkout and PayPal. So there, you know, stablecoin settlement for SMEs, three percent on the merchant discount rate for cross-border when there's a card. That's a lot for, you know, on the bottom line for a lot of these SMEs with razor-thin margins. Uh, and, and even for the working capital, one week, especially with bank holidays and stuff, this is having instant gig economy workers, you know, where every uh, hour matters how fast it is, they, you know, they're getting access to the cash. And, and we see that increasingly in a lot of these pilots, even the large networks, the banking institutions themselves are talking about financial institutions. They are looking at wholesale banking and in terms of how they do their uh, treasury management and others. So it may start in B2B, it may start in the merchant space, but it's a lot easier to manage the regulation, the KYC or KYB process and be more, you know, mitigate the risk. And then before it goes into the individual area, because of the risks that we mentioned, we don't want people access to stable coin unless the central banks in Africa rightly said and put it in the exchange and start trading and stuff, right? So so there are concerns, but, but there are definitely big pockets with fin Techs are, uh, I see, uh, exploiting, and 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 we hope that trend continues. I think uh, a lot of the startups, to be honest, when I initially met, was more like they have on the capital market side. They have the derivative exchanges, uh, many different kinds of structured products, uh, uh, and market makers, liquidity providers, and stuff like that. We would like to see more in the financial domain. It's, it's good to see like some of the large players in Africa, Latin America, Philippines, you know, the household names, the mobile wallets, the super apps and stuff. So uh, both established players and they need, I think what startups will provide here is how fast and nimble they are. For instance, uh, we can sell a startup uh, even though we are in dozen markets, but we've been able to quickly establish the pipes. Connect with collaboration is key. So we connect with the single EU uh, payment area, SEPA, in, because you need to make those on off ramps cheap. So we address that problem pretty quick. We drill in and we focus on that with the EU corridor. Same way in Africa side, it's not banks. I mean, we saw the data, billions don't have access. So you need to connect to the mobile wallets. I think that's where startups will have the edge in, in, in solving that one specific issue of access or connectivity pretty quick.